Okay, so first of all, a very warm welcome to both of you and thank you for joining us so generously. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Are these on? Yes. Are these on? Yes. So um, maybe let's start a bit with um, your biography, your history. I know you, you were born in Germany and maybe you'll tell us a bit you uh, about your own life. Okay, well my biography in a nutshell is that I was born in Germany in an extremely German orientated family. We were on a Saturday afternoon we all had to assemble at home and we learned about the German classics we had to know about Faust, Schiller, Goethe, you know, the typical Jewish-German culture-mad household. The Jewish bit was not at all um, accentuated, but I learned that I was Jewish at my school when I was about eight, and I wanted to, uh, it was a little private school, I wanted to wipe the uh, blackboard, and the child said, don't give the Jew the sponge. I didn't understand at all what what was talk about here. What was talk about here? So I, I asked my father, "What does this mean?" So he tried to explain to me what it is, means to be Jewish, and it didn't take too long that you understood what it was like to be Jewish in Germany. So bit by bit, we were isolated from our friends that we had. My sister had an experience that she had an Aryan friend who used to come to our house to sleep and she used to go to their house to sleep and when she rang the bell one day she was told, I'm sorry, you can no longer come to this house. So this is a bit of a trauma for a child who doesn't understand at all what's going on. Then things got from bad to worse. We had to leave our schools, go to a Jewish school. Then we had to work in a factory and uh, yeah and the deportation started. I don't know how much you know about the history, but in 1942, when the war broke out, you know, my father was still trying to emigrate somewhere, but as usual in such situations, frontiers closed, and who wants a lot of Jewish immigrants? So life became completely impossible. I have in my book letters that my father wrote all over the place. Nothing happened. In the end, my parents decided that they'd try and send at least my sister and I out to save us. But even that didn't happen. Had the war broken out a week later, my sister would have been saved in England. Anyway, it was a sad but not an unusual story. We got stuck in Germany and uh, 1942, the deportation started. My parents were deported somewhere to the east in a place called Ispitza where I learned later that the people had to dig their own graves and be shot naked into these graves. My sister and I were working in a factory. I'm an expert toilet paper maker. And uh, I'm a pretty bolshy person. My sister and I, we didn't, I did not accept that I'll just sit there and wait till some idiot comes and takes me away and kills me. So we involved ourselves in clandestine activities, helped French prisoners to escape by forging papers, etc. Which all sounds very dramatic and was actually my saving because we were, of course, eventually caught trying to escape ourselves. But in German law, which was very lucky, I think it must have been a friend of my father's who intervened, I think it is better if we make these two girls into criminals rather than just Jews. Criminals for forging papers, helping the enemy and trying to escape, which resulted that we were sent to prison. It sounds all very dramatic now, and of course it's not very nice to be sent to a prison, but the year in prison saved me a year in Auschwitz. And we actually had a court case and we were sentenced I was sentenced to a year and a half uh, in prison and my sister was sentenced to three and a half years penitentiary. But by that time, uh, the situation in Germany was terrible. The uh, prisons were completely overcrowded and I never finished my sentence. I was sent to Auschwitz. Shall I continue? Yes. 
I was sent to Auschwitz expect, knowing everything what was going on there. So I was expecting to go straight into a gas chamber. And then a complete miracle happened. When you come to Auschwitz, there is a sort of ceremony of, you know, you, you are sent to a block where people tattoo, tattoo a number on your arm and take your clothes off you. And uh, the person that took my clothes off me took my shoes and she said, oh, I can use these shoes. Uh, I'm not interested in shoes anymore. And these were a very special pair of shoes which were unique in the world because they've been dyed black with red pom-poms in it. And uh, I had a conversation with the person who did all this, um, this ceremony. They were all prisoners. And she asked me, where, where do you come from? And uh, how long do you think the war will last? What did you do before the war? And like an idiot, I said, I... I used to play the cello. Oh, she said, fantastic. I said, what are you talking about? Well, there's an orchestra here and they need a cellist. So to cut a very long story short, I finished up in this, um, in this famous women's orchestra in Birkenau. And when my sister arrived a week later from, uh, from the penitentiary, she saw the shoes on the ground, which were quite unique. And she recognized the shoes and uh, said, I know these shoes. So the girl who did this ceremony said, well, this is somebody who's in the orchestra now. I said, well, this is my sister. So we found ourselves again through this ridiculous pair of shoes. <laughs> and we both survived. And I think I have to thank the fact that I played the cello that I survived. Because I was doing a job, you know. As long as they want music there, we were living. Shall I go on? <laughs> I <take> the... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the next step was the Russians came nearer, Auschwitz was evacuated, and we finished up in Belsen. Now, I come to Belsen, which was very different from Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, people killed you in the most sophisticated way. In Belsen, they didn't need any of the machinery. You just, man ist krepiert dort. Nothing to eat, nothing. Belsen was... So we were just sat, sitting there waiting to die. And then the British army arrived. And we were liberated. Unbelievable, unbelievable happening. I mean, anybody who was there on the 15th of April will never forget that day. We're still alive. It's, it's, it's a complete miracle. I mean, nobody thought that we would survive this. But then we had other problems. <laughs> I don't know whether I should go on now. <laughs> yes, yes, maybe you said before we, we had a conversation and, and somebody asked you, so why did you choose, choose to live in London? And you, you said it wasn't a choice. Maybe you talk oh, yes. about Of course, you can imagine the British had a, suddenly were lumbered with thousands of peculiar people. All nationalities was like the, like the uh, Tower of Babel, languages they didn't know what to do with us. So now I start having a problem because I am German. Basically. Can you speak a little bit more into that? Yes, yeah, so they put us, they thought, which was a quite logical thought, into nationalities with a view of sending us home. So they get the French people, right? Belgian people, Dutch people. And when I was asked what I am, I had to say I am German because I was born here. And to be German in 1945 was like having a, a disease, German. No, I'm not really German. I'm, I was born in Germany, but I'm Jewish. And that isn't always that uh, welcome piece of news as well. So we understood very soon that we have a problem here. We are German Jews. So what do we do? Do you want to send us back to Germany? I didn't want to live in Germany. So with a little bit of more forging papers, I finally managed to get to London with my sister. And I thought that I'm now going to have a normal, I'm now being a normal person. Well, it's interesting <laughs> what one imagined normality to be. So, well, I then met my husband and uh, created a family and had children and thought that they'll be normal. The German bit is out of our, uh, out of our lives. We just live in England now and have children and be normal. Now I must hand over to my daughter, who will tell you how normal we were. <laughs> 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 
Right. So before we had already a conversation, as you can imagine, and um, and I found it very interesting if you to hear both of your perspectives. So on the one hand, you're the daughter of somebody that survived uh, that history, but you you're also a professional that deals with transgenerational trauma and psychotherapy. But maybe you can speak first as a daughter, and maybe afterwards we talk on the professional level about your interest? I'm probably more of an expert daughter than... Huh? Sorry? Nearer to my mouth? Yeah. Like this. She's much more experienced. <laughs> She's like... The superstar. I, I'm the second act, okay? Is this better? Is this it? Okay. Right. Um, Humour's really important. We laugh at the most crazy things, but it's one of the best things as well. So, what's it like to be the daughter? Really hard. Very, very hard. Um, it's taken, really, probably only in the last 10 years of my life has there become a context from which to really make meaning and understand what it is that is and has been so hard of a survivor and this thing called normal which let's face it none of us really know what that means but a kind of disavowal that's called normal that I was born into so imagine imagine this 1958 I was born, not so many years later. My parents, obviously, are German Jews, very strange professions, musicians, living in a part of London that's now super cool, but then was a ghetto for immigrants. And um, I was the only person who had this really weird surname I was certainly the only person who had parents with this particular accent, certainly the only kid whose parents had strange jobs called musicians. Most of my friends thought I said magician, and they were really disappointed when they came around and there was no magic going on. It's like, where's the magic? I think I lied sometimes and said window cleaner, something. So whatever. Because kids want to be the same as each other and they want to fit in. But the families we're born into are the first place where we're meant to belong. And I always felt a profound sense of unbelonging. But I know now that this was an unconscious internalization of my parents' experience. So I was a refugee not knowing that I was a refugee, not knowing anything at all. Except that, as I said, I felt I didn't belong anywhere. Probably the other huge difficulty was my mother's motivation, which was honourable, but misguided, was to try to create, again, the normal thing, but she thought, because let's remember, my mother stopped having parents when she was 14 years old. That was great parents, though, but finished at 14. So my mother thought that if she kind of plugged me into some sort of infrastructure called school, that everything else would take care of itself. Well, it wasn't, really wasn't like that for me at all. So I think, which is quite interesting in your work, Thomas, particularly, is I somatized from the age of three. And the manifestation of my somatization was I became an obese infant. And I mean obese, I don't mean a little plump. I mean obese. Now, what's that about? My first word was more. More. And the more was more of anything, just more. Because I had such a profound 
absence of anything. So from the age of two or three, my search began to try and fill this thing that was without words, without explanation, but was about profound absence and loss. So, I think the other thing, remembering the moment in history, was a sense of shame. I wanted my mummy to be like my friend's mummies. My mummy had her phone number on her arm. That's really weird. How do you explain that? I couldn't, because I didn't know why. But I knew it was bad. And how do we internalize that which we cannot put words to? It is a bad feeling. Shame. I remember as a child, my mother, and again, we must remember, this is 1960s now, if occasionally we would be out somewhere public and there was German, my mother had a reaction to it. German cars were bad, just German was bad. But my parents spoke German to each other. How do you figure that out? Yet, the unconscious communication was so powerful that neither my brother or I absorbed the German language. I don't speak German. Now, we all know how kids are sponges for language didn't happen. So language, German was forbidden, yet it was the language of intimacy. Go figure that out. So I think a state of bewilderment and confusion is the sort of landscape of the experience of being second generation, of certainly my experience of being the daughter of a survivor. Yeah. First of all, it's, it's, I believe it's so precious that you, with also your own background of inner, inner clarification, can speak in such a clear and precise way about your own experience. So that's, I think, that's very important. And before I come to the professional uh, part, I would, I would be interested, how was it for you to make how long did it take and how was it for you to make your first step back into Germany? Uh, well, I swore never ever to put my foot on German soil again. My hatred of the Germans was more <laughs> profound and more logical than they could possibly have hated me. So, uh, we never spoke at home about, I mean, as my daughter says, you know, that was a sort of mystery thing, you know, my mother has a funny number on her arm and I didn't want to explain to my children that there are people in this world who are so awful, you know, I didn't want to turn my children's brains into hatred. If I hate the Germans, that's my business. I didn't want to really bring them up as hating Germans. Hatred should be... Uh, you know, exercised from the language anyway. So what happened in the end was um, there was a film, uh, yeah, there was a lot of photography going on in Belsen after the liberation. Some of you might have seen the film anyway. It's called A Painful Reminder because it was so awful what they found in Belsen. I mean, it was nothing but bodies everywhere. They so thought we must photograph that for, the, for posterity because nobody will believe it. And it was so awful that in fact they were told, no, nobody will believe it unless you photograph it cleverly. So they got Mr. Hitchcock to advise them who knew something about filming. And then it was, that was a time politically that the uh, world was a bit worried about the Russians. So they decided not to show it. It was all buried in the Imperial War Museum. And years later, they unearthed it and they thought we must cut these reels together into a film that we can show, a 50-minute, um, uh, you know, proper documentary. But there was no language at all, nothing was, everything was just 
unbelievable pictures. So they phoned me up and asked me whether I would do a commentary for that film. And there were, we were three survivors who commented on that film. And when that was first shown in England, they did a wonderful ceremony, invited everybody who was at the liberation of Belson present, Red Cross people, etc. And the film was shown for the first time in a private uh, thing before it got into the public domain. And that is, I don't know, did you come to that? I can't remember. But uh, my son was there and he said, you know, mum, you never told us anything. True. You know the sort of life that musicians lead you much more, I didn't, what is this about, you know, let's get on with life. So I said, <laughs> I think I'll write something down and that is where it started. So I started rolling the film backwards as it were and wrote down what happened. And I called it Inherit the Truth. Because I, and I, I sort of wrote a letter of apology, excuse me that I come so late with this, but I think you should inherit the truth, because I know a lot of people who regret infinitely not to have asked their parents what actually happened. With the excuse, well, they didn't want to talk about it. I can tell you something, we wanted to be asked. When we first came out of this mess, we wanted to be asked but nobody asked any questions. We fell into a huge hole of silence. Understandable in Germany, but in England, you know, people are very discreet, etc. We didn't, wir wollten dich nicht aufregen. Ich habe mich mehr aufgeregt, dass man mich nicht gefragt hat. So uh, finally I wrote it down, uh, wrote everything down, and then it was made into a proper book. I mean, the, I'm not a professional writer. So it was all too long and not everything is interesting. And so now there is a book out and uh, I got invited to Germany and that's when I went for the, for the first time. Now actually, it is not quite true. The orchestra that I, you know, I played in an international orchestra. We traveled all over the world. Anita doesn't go to Germany. There are lots of concerts in Germany. It doesn't matter. Anita doesn't come. Another cellist will come. But I got a list every month. We got a list where we are going. So we go to Italy. We go to America. We go to Zoltau and we go to Celle. These are places very near Belsen. This is the first time I went. So I phoned the orchestra up. I said, I'm coming with you. Gott behüte, she will come with a big, you know, shoot everybody. I said, don't worry. <laughs> I won't even talk to anybody. I will just want to see what happened to the camp. So this is the first time I went to Germany. And I don't regret it because I met really fantastic people there and, uh, you know, it, that frontier was Crossed. And I'm very glad, I mean, people ask me, how do you feel, because I'm a lot in Germany, I spoke, speak in schools and, and various places. I, uh, I'm not even interested whether anybody is German. First, I want to know whether they are human beings, and where they happen to be born doesn't really interest me anymore. So, um, yeah, I have no problem being in Germany, and I have wonderful letters from young German school children, wonderful letters. So, yeah, so it's, I think I've, I'm doing the right thing here to come and talk to people. <laughs> another, thing, another thing that I find very important now, because I'm sort of myself learning a little bit of Jewish history, that there's a little bit more emphasis on trying to explain why there is so much anti-Semitism, why anti-Semitism is doing very well again, you know. Careful. Teach a little bit of Jewish history. Where do we come from? Why are we so clever with money? And why are we all rich? I mean, I wish it was true. I mean, it's complete nonsense. Um, <laughs> why is it that Jews are so sort of brain people, because we weren't allowed to be anything other than money, uh, Geldwechsler, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, to deal with money, to keep uh, taverns and, uh, and deal with animals. That, and you know, the first country that allowed Jews to study was Germany. 
But even then, the Jews were not allowed to live in the towns, or they had to pay double, um, what do you call, uh, you know, uh, tax. You know, what you actually reproach the Jews with has been done to the Jews. But, you know, because we chased from one place to the other over the centuries, the result is that wherever you go, you find Jewish people because they haven't been allowed to stay in one place. So, I mean, uh, to, to cut it uh, short, as it's very important to teach young people a little bit the background of who are Jews, really. Very difficult to explain. Is, is it a religion? Is it a, a race? Is it a, very difficult to explain? There are all sorts of Jews, you know, the ones from Spain, the ones from Russia. It's not just eine Massen. Juden, jetzt tun wir euch alle nach Madagaskar stecken. What is <laughs> Was ist das? Yeah. Anyway, so CD, I hand over to you. Did you ever consider uh, moving to Israel as many other people did after the after the Holocaust in, in Germany and in Europe? Many people decided to go to a country that is a Jewish country. Did you ever consider moving to Israel, or that was never... Did I ever contemplate going to Israel? No. I like the Jews a little bit diluted. It's too loud for me, Israel. <laughs> <laughs> now, I like living in England because I, were, I like a little bit of distance, you know. Yeah, no, I had, wouldn't. I, I've been there, of course. I feel very happy when I go there, but uh, no, I wouldn't live there. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to live in England. And um, for you, um, so what I heard that to find a belonging in the country where you grew up, maybe also in the family where you grew up, that there was kind of, and with your friends, that there was always a question of belonging. That's, that's what I heard. And um, so when you, when you see this now through the eyes of you being a psychoanalyst and a therapist and so, can you tell me what are your thoughts, maybe your contemplation as a psychologically trained uh, professional onto your own life history and in general for people that, that in a way go through the process of being a second generation child? And what well, can you talk a bit? Because here are so many people that are interested in trauma and inner development. It's uh, obviously a very big question, and I'm trying to think of a way to enter, how to enter your question the best. But I think, for me, the professional and the personal are inseparable. So, eventually finding a kind of home in my professional world, I trained as I believe most people should, fairly late. I avoided all education by a variety of not very healthy means until I was probably in my 30s. So I, I did my analytic training, yeah, in my late 30s. So I already had a sense of some self-knowledge but the most important thing, I think, for me was to do with the lifelong quest for belonging somewhere. Coming from a family of musicians who all had a profound sense of belonging, which I was not part of, the need to find some sort of collective was very powerful. And I will tell you, because I think it's important because of the theme of the conference today, and I don't have any British colleagues here, so I don't think I need to worry. Put your hands up now. <laughs> okay? Okay. So, I had, I had many, many lost years, although they were meaningful in their own way. I was a drug addict. I was disenfranchised for probably 20 years of my life because I couldn't find another way of being in the world. And that identity was an identity, so it was better than a non-identity. 
So I had a very acute awareness of my suffering because I always knew, apart from drugs being fun initially, I was self-medicating because I felt, I always felt that it was somatically and psychologically so hard for me to be in the world. And I had a hyper-arousal syndrome, acute anxiety, which just isn't compatible with life. It isn't compatible with life. And I spent weeks and months sometimes just wanting to hide in a toilet because I couldn't cope with the world. So eventually finding a work that made sense to me or had a language that made sense to me was a tremendous relief. And I worked for many years in addiction before I did my analytic training. And then my work in addiction and the sort of understanding of why people use drugs, the model we were working in wasn't sufficient for my uh, interests. So I trained and analytically and came to understand the whole sort of use of um, objects, uh, transitional objects, as things from which we can from which we can comfort ourselves. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Winnicott's work. Um, Donald Winnicott, who was a wonderful doctor and analyst in England, who wrote a lot about attachment and the idea of being a good enough parent, a good enough mother, but the essential need for a child to have something they could hold on to. So I was a child, although of course I had a mother and a father. They, they were absent both literally because my mum had a lot of life to make up for. I think it's fair to say that. Yeah. But as a child it was just an unbearable loss. Terrible because I had no sort of internal structure and this sort of external object, my mother, was in South America or wherever she happened to be. Um, so the need for me to find other things from which to make myself better was essential, really essential. But what's interesting is it started, as I said earlier, from when I was three years old. Consciously, I knew I had to find something to fix myself with. Um, so have, I think I've probably gone off piste here, have I? No, no, it's no? okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I see my work, it's interesting, I, there are many other things I would love to do and like to do, but it seems that probably, probably my life's work is to do with healing and being with people, but I want something back too. I, I, <laughs> you know, I don't do this as a kind of um, one-way traffic. It's very much a relational uh, experience for me. And one of the things is why, although I'm born in England, I'm not a Brit. And why I'm so grateful for people like Thomas to come into my life and other places in the world that I make sure I go to is because I'm welcomed. Because I connect much more with not English people. Because there is, I think, a willingness to engage and an openness that allows for something much deeper to happen and something that I'm very interested in is that level of communication that it's really heart to heart communication where one can really feel alive because I've lived a lot of my life not being alive and I cannot tell you how determined I am to live my life now you know I'm like on time mom yep. on fire you could say this woman is on fire <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why it is so lucky to be a musician. UK is completely mad. I've got a British passport. I'm now European for a bit longer. <laughs> and, um, but how English am I? You know, there's, there's nobody in the background. I can't. You know, it was also very difficult to bring up children um, 
we, we had no money. If I say no money, I mean no money. I was standing there with nothing. And everything that I have had was painfully uh, acquired. Now you go and then you have a daughter who wants everything. Because she wants to be, <laughs> she wants to be like everybody else. So you can't really blame her. And then she lands up with a mother who, uh, who keeps saying, das braucht man nicht. <laughs> and I still say that, actually. <laughs> das braucht man schon, but I mean, it's, it's her bad luck and the bad luck of this generation to be landed with somebody like that who knows that it is stupid to accumulate stuff. You only lose it, you know. You, I mean, already if, uh, letters from Belgium. She's going to go off on one now. Pardon? I just want to interject for a moment, yeah. if I may. On the subject of things and the acquiring of things. On the subject of things and the acquiring of things. Yeah. I'm not scared anymore. Good. <laughs> I don't bother to hide the bag or lie. And if my mother disapproves, it's got to be her problem. <laughs> really? It's very unlucky, really. No, no, because for years, it meant I had to feel guilty about wanting or having, rather than taking pleasure and enjoying. Okay, sometimes I can be excessive. <laughs> <laughs> but it's part of who I am, you know? So, if I can have two, I will maybe have two. <laughs> In other words, she's very, very unfortunate to have me as a mother. No, it's not true. <laughs> However, we survive. <laughs> well, let me tell you that there's a sort of... <laughs> Apropos the Germanness in us, one of my grandsons is a singer. He speaks fluent German. And he's just getting out his German nationality again, which we are now allowed to do. So there's a sort of return journey now to, to being German. Yeah. So. I have, I recall from our prior conversation I think you mentioned something and then you responded to it and I would love to bring this also here. You said there is a hierarchy of suffering and and I would love to hear a bit what you mean with this term and maybe how how you experience this, both of you. Okay, um, grow, growing up in a family, in my family, the whole concept of suffering, well, it's, what, it, what is it, what is that? My mother, please God, touch wood and everything else is, as we can see, quite remarkable by anybody's standards and please God will continue to have good health. But, but she's not made of the same stuff that I'm made of. So, hierarchy of suffering, let's start with something really simple. I don't feel well. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Don't be stupid. Just get on with it. But I really don't feel well. Well, what's wrong with you? What's, you're not hungry? You're not... Get on with it. Okay. So, what do you do then, uh, as we're talking now, young, as a child, what do you do then with the experience of not feeling good, whether that's in your body or in whatever way? Well, some, something begins to happen with it. You begin to sort of not know how to figure out or differentiate what it is to suffer other than, well I clearly am not really getting it right there's something that I really don't get about this suffering business, yet I know it exists 
And at some point, and I really have no idea how old I was because my mother told me nothing about anything because she wanted to protect us. And I only found things out by covert discovery of cigarette searching. Instead of finding cigarettes, I found pictures of concentration camps. When I, so I was maybe 13 years old. That was my first encounter. So there was some connection with suffering. This is what suffering looks like then. And of course, this is pre-internet, pre-anything like that. So I just had these images lodged in my mind, and I knew, was I guilty for looking for cigarettes, or was I guilty for finding these photographs? But is that what suffering is? So I learned very young that there was something about my condition that was, although for me, very, very difficult to bear, somehow didn't fit into my mother's concept of what suffering was. So that's the sort of beginning stage of the whole idea of, for me, of the hierarchy of suffering. So, Mum. Microphone. Yeah, I mean, I'm the wrong person to ask of suffering. I mean, it's... What does this generation suffer from? That they haven't got the right uh, shoe make, uh, mark of shoes or something? You know, I'm so, I'm so from a different world as far as suffering is concerned that I really can't, uh, I can't comment on that. But I'll, I'll respect that I don't expect uh, the next generation to be uh, like me without having these experiences. Suffering, uh, you know, I mean. And of course we are pretty hard-boiled people, we, people who, who actually survived this unbelievable time, you know, with no food, no nothing, I mean nothing. And always ready to be uh, stuck in a gas chamber. If not today, then tomorrow. I mean, one lived hour by hour. So it is not so easy for people who have experienced that uh, to be full of sympathy for people who need 20 pairs of shoes. You know, it's, it's, it's another world I come from. But, uh, you know, we survive. Uh, it's okay. I, uh, I understand that some people need more than other people, but she's very unlucky with the choice of her mother, really, because, as I say, I'm in a minimalist mini mist. You know, I don't need anything. Already in Belson, when people tried, after liberation, tried to send us clothes and things, I said, don't send us anything. I have got, uh, I've got a pair of trousers and I've got a blouse. It's enough. You know, I already knew that. Of course, in the meantime, don't think that I haven't also accumulated a lot of rubbish. Now I'm the age where I'm trying to get rid of it. <laughs> Hundreds of German books, who wants them? They can't even read the uh, Gothic uh, script anymore, you know. It's terrible. Yeah. So there you are. And when you when you come to Germany to teach in schools, so what are the what are the things that you think are important for the next generation to know? When you get invited to schools, what what is yeah, what do you I present? Have very good experiences in schools. I have got one very nice letter from a boy who said. Uh, who wrote to me, said, you know, I came, uh, went to school and there was an advertisement, da ist wieder so eine alte Frau, die war im KZ, die macht, da gehe ich nicht mehr hin. But I was forced to go and I'm so grateful because it's the first time I understood that what happened was next door, not millions of miles away. You know, that the children actually understand that it's not that long ago. So these things are important to me, whether it uh, actually produces positive thinking, I don't know. But at least one tries to do something. And I should be, there'll be, you know, in the school, say I speak to 300 people, there may be three people who I have reached who will say, that's alles Quatsch, what these Juden just wieder erzählen, said, no, it's, I met somebody, no, no, it's, it was true. It's already enough. It's like throwing a stone on, you know, that 
maybe it gets somewhere. Because it must be a complete mystery to me that sort of time, to you, the sort of time that uh, I'm talking about. I'm pre-war material, you know. <laughs> I always said it's a made of better stuff, you know, that's why I'm so tough compared to the generation now who all suffer from this, that, and the other. It's like houses that were built before the war are better than the ones that are built after the war. <laughs> and uh, one more question to you, and then maybe we can open the questions also from the audience. Um, uh, when you say now from, like, from a professional standpoint, well, how do you see the research in the world of, of collective trauma or transgenerational trauma? Maybe you can speak a bit of your interest in it and uh, what, how expanded do you see this research be in the world? What do you think, how can we grow our knowledge? And Well, it's what's very interesting to me that the UK is so absent on this in this, on this incredibly important work. And in, in terms of the scientific and genetic recognition of there being a cellular change, this, this is kind of so fantastically important because it further kind of allows us and provides us with contexts in which to really think about our, our experiences. So I think it's fantastic that at last gatherings like this, um, other international conferences are taking place. I, I think it's wonderful that this is not a gathering of just professional people, by which I mean just clinicians, because this is after all a human subject and we are all implicated, we're all involved everybody has experienced in one way or another trauma, transgenerational trauma. So I'm heartened and relieved that we at last have a language. I've waited a long time for this language to exist, to have words in which we can dialogue internationally about these subjects. But again, as I said, I'm, I'm mystified as to why the country that I happen to have been born in is so, I don't know, resistant, something is going on, but I've spoken to you and I'm going to be the UK pocket, sell. <laughs> So, so I, I think w what I want to say is that I'm really inspired by the generosity, which really moves me because it's something that you know I have been hungry for my whole life. I mean, I, 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 as I've said to a few people earlier who happen to be therapists, don't tell me what model you are. Tell me if you're good and tell me if you're kind. And if you're funny as well, then that's a real bonus. So the, these for me are the, the core human conditions that perhaps allow us, and of course intelligence, that allow us the possibility of change and which allows people to connect and why you guys are all here. And I also notice, which is beautiful, you all seem to smile, you know, you all, I, I haven't looked at everybody's face, but faces that I've noticed, you've all open and smiling and engaged. This is unusual, this is, I mean, I know you're an unusual, this is an unusual <laughs> gathering. <laughs> True, but there's a, you know, a lot of you to say, okay, this is something special happening here, and I love that. I, you know, people are making eye contact with each other, and there's something on a cellular level, which is, I think, where well, well, healing can really happen, because I, I think we'll all remember this, these moments, and that, that's a wonderful thing. So, yeah. I think just, just the last thing to say is I think the human, I want to emphasize as well the human level, you know, of course we have to write academic papers, of course we have to have theories, of course, of course, but let's remember the human condition. The human condition doesn't read those books or necessarily understand those papers, but what we understand is connection. So let's make that 
the forefront of what we do. Well, I would love to, to open also the possibility for anybody who has a question, maybe you raise your hand and uh, you can address whomever you want. Yeah, let's start with you. Mm -hmm. And we'll, there are multiple questions. So. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for being here. And I would like to ask about your belief in God in the different stages of your life. Was there a connection? Was there a belief? Or how did you relate to something bigger? Belief in God. Did you ever have one? What is it now? No. I am asked that question quite, uh, quite often. I certainly don't believe in somebody sitting up there looking down and see that everything is okay, because if that should be so, he's making a very, very bad job. <laughs> When I'm asked that question, I tell people whether they understand what I'm talking about or not. I said, read what Faust said to Gretchen when she asked him, wie hältst du's mit der Religion? I don't know how familiar you are with your Faust. Wer kann ihn nennen, den Allerhalter, den Allumfasser, fest und erhält er nicht dich, mich, sich selbst? It is such a wonderful speech, I don't know, I can't uh, uh, recite it all from memory. That's how I feel. Look at, the, look at nature, look, at, look in the right direction, that in fact the world is very, very beautiful, if you look in the right direction. And that's what Faust answered Gretchen when she asked him. So your answer is, do I believe in God? I believe in something bigger than we are, but uh, I don't believe in going on a certain day to either a church or a synagogue and be religious. Maybe I'll feel religious on Tuesday. <laughs> you know, I have a garden and I've got a very interesting plant there, a passion flower. I don't know whether you know it. It's unbelievable. And you look at that. Well, that's my higher power. And also the question is also for, the, for you as daughter. And for you as daughter, how is that your spiritual alignment or connection to God? You will take the oh, same me? question. Yes. Sorry. Uh, Hmm. Uh, it, mm, I, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't practice anything in an organized way. Um, I did, I would never say I practiced Judaism, but I was involved in the Jewish life for a while and found things in it that I, that I enjoyed, the communal things. So f for me, I think it, it, it's, I find the greatest feeling of enlightenment or lightness or joy in moments where we're all laughing together or I might have a connection with somebody that is transformative. It could be very simple. Or indeed, the sort of wonderful, actually, new thing for me, the relationship I have with myself these days. Now, I don't mean that in a narcissistic way, don't get me wrong. Please, nothing to do with narcissism. More to do with a sort of peace of mind of, actually, maybe I'm okay. Maybe I'm okay. And then that can allow me to enjoy a flower or anything really simple. Um, so it's, it's not complicated, it's perhaps, perhaps that's the beauty of it, that it's not actually really complicated, that it's just about an acceptance, which perhaps is something that I'm more, a little closer to than maybe I have been in my life before now, if that answers you. 
If I might just add something that I think religion at the moment we see is quite a dangerous affair. So careful, organized religion. I mean, you know what's going on. And you know, if you think back, how did it all start, religion? Kreuzzüge. Straight away, blood is flowing. So I'm very skeptical of... Maybe, uh, you know, uh, the general mass of people needs something to hold on to, so religion, but I think it's dangerous. Okay, who else wants to ask something? Um, yeah, maybe let's go over here, the lady first, and then maybe the gentleman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. I'm not sure if, if I should speak in English or German, so it's about you. Um, I've seen you four years ago for the first time in a, in a show in the TV where you were talking about your, what you're doing and you come with your life experience and your history, you come back to Germany to go in our schools and it's moved me all the time very much because for you, you were the most generous person I know. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, you are one of these beautiful plants in my garden. Thank, Thank you, you so plants. much. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for, for sharing your lives, um, both of you, and to have the family uh, uh, sharing these stories. Um, I'm, my question was really about transgenerational trauma and a, a different family situation than you have, because I know so many, so many children uh, were orphaned. So many Jewish children were orphaned during the war. Many of them went to England. And from my own personal story, too, I'm just wondering, in the work that you do in transgenerational dra uh, trauma, what are, the, what are your thoughts or what are maybe some of the dynamics of this when a child loses their parents in this incredible situation and has to go on living? but without the dynamic that you had, where there was a secret or there was something that you knew was there but you didn't know. So if you could just maybe shed some light on the transgenerational trauma for the orphans. You mean, you mean, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I've completely understood your question. Can, can you? Yeah, no, there's, um, for the kids, for the Jewish children that were orphaned, say at eight, nine, ten, and had to go on living, yeah. You mean the kids that came out on the kinder transport? Is that is, is that the kind of? Yeah, on, or elsewhere around the world. Yeah, yeah just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think it again where this whole issue of the hierarchy of suffering comes into the question. I think it's really really complicated. I, I think one of the things that that particular group, let's say, um, of kinder transport children that came out, they had, which I think is incredibly important in, in the sort of, in, for the human condition, was a, a group to which they could belong. So there was a group of children called the kinder transport. So, that was the beginning of another identity, not a welcome one, but an identity nonetheless. So I think that the isolation and terror of 
and fantasy about you know what had happened to the, their parents and, and the new sort of culture that they were being thrown into was incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult. But I think that particular generation also had a kind of attitude instilled in them where you know gratitude, be grateful that you're alive and get on with it and make the most of things was very much the sort of currency, very much the currency. So again, I think it's the um, children of that manifest the difficulties, the overt difficulties. I mean, doing is a great therapy anyway, isn't it? Distraction, doing, building, making, which was essential. But when the space comes along for the next generation to have feelings and reactions, that's when the sort of overt difficulties come in. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's a very painful and difficult lifelong grief that people with that experience carry. And I think the continuity of that is a hyper-anxiety about impermanence and uncertainty. You know, my, my, my mother has, and I have inherited it, a hyper-vigilance about if someone is where they're meant to be, when they're meant to be there. Okay, that's normal. But is it normal to think they're dead if they're five minutes late? I don't think so. I, I have had such powerful anxiety that I have convinced airlines to disclose passenger lists to me. That's pretty amazing. Such is the level of my anxiety that I've been able to communicate. No, no, you don't understand. I have to know if my mother is on that plane. I'm talking about 1990. I'm not talking about, you know... So this level of anxiety that one carries around through life is like a sort of a shadow, a shadow side. And it's a side that one has to befriend, otherwise it can take over. But it's a really a heavy, a heavy load to be in a constant sort of state of either being frightened or preparing to be frightened well, what if you could be frightened? You know, that's the sort of level of arousal that I think people with that kind of traumatic experience carry around that never leaves, never ever leaves. It's embedded and a lot of physical and psychological difficulties ar arise out of this, I believe. So I think one of the things that's really important for people that I try to engage with, with people who have trauma issues, is the whole physicality of the experience. Because words, I think, can be traumatizing. I mean, I've obviously, as a shrink, have been in analysis, was in analysis for many years. When I was at my most disturbed, I couldn't bear language. Because I couldn't make use of it. Not that I was incoherent, but it was like an assault. You know, what was happening was happening in my body. And I wish I had been invited to move or do something else. So I think this is really, really important, is to sort of engage with what's going on in the body that can't be put into words. Okay, where is it? What does your body want to do in response to that feeling state? And in, in, in that healing, I think, or movement, let's call it movement, can, can happen. There you are. Yeah, maybe we go to the other side, maybe first here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you mentioned um, uh, the word connection, and you mentioned also, I'm speaking to you, sorry. Yes, uh, you mentioned also that you find the uh, uh, pictures at 13 years. I was I was wondering when did you together? Sorry. Uh, sorry, could you say that again? Yeah, I, I was nervous, so I wasn't saying anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering when did you two connect about her history, and did you try to? Did you take the step to 
speak with each other or I'm curious about that. It's happening right now in front of your eyes. I wanted to be, and I was, the first person that my mother took back to Breslau and Auschwitz. And I wanted to do this, well, many, many, many reasons, but it had to be me. So this was 21 years ago, 21 years ago, yeah, and 20 years, yeah. And we had had no conversations. What we had was, I would hear my mother being interviewed, or I would hear a documentary, or something that had been written. But how do you talk about this? It's impossible, it felt impossible. It's, it's still very difficult because it's very, very painful, obviously. What I was thinking more recently, I was writing something, I can't remember what, but was about the loss. The loss is not only about the terrible things, I mean, you know, all that happened, it's the loss of all the good things. My mum had wonderful parents. I had lovely grandparents. I didn't get to meet them. But it's been very hard for my mum to let me know who they were. This is, this is a loss. But, I, I, you know, I, I know that there are some things that you know, there's some places you can't go to somehow. So, my mother has partly survived from not being an overtly emotional person. This is a, for my mother, I think it's been a strength. So, Doing events like this together is probably the most powerful, meaningful way because there is a context and a framework which provides a container, which is pretty important for dialogues like this to happen. So we're talking with all of you, but we're talking to each other. So, are we? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you witnessed it, we are, right? Yeah. I don't know what I want to say really, but I mean, it is true, it is, uh, you know, I never fitted my, my past somehow into their lives. Yeah, it was probably a conscious effort that, that das war mal und jetzt ist was anderes, you know. And I was, you know, one, the one most important job that mothers have is to bring up children. And that's the one thing we are never taught really how to do it, you know. So we all make terrible mistakes. Yeah, that should be, a, well, I don't know whether there is one way of doing it, but I obviously haven't done it right somehow. But it was difficult, you know. I mean, my life is so in two parts. For me, before and after. But this is, of course, the most profound example of dissociation. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> ask away. Fragt, wir sind die Letzten. But something, it's interesting, of course, because I was frightened of my mother most of my life. She's pretty scary, right? She's formidable, formidable. She's a scary lady. I'm not frightened of her anymore. Pity. <laughs> you heard it here. You know, but, but that fear is a kind of a, an organizing factor. But I think, you know, there's enough, enough already of that. Yeah, I'm pretty... I'm told I'm a pretty scary person, so... It's not true, really. 
So, any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the lady with the blonde hair in the back. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you can get up that we can. Yeah, that we. Yeah. I need to ask in, in German. I would want that what they said, ask you. We are the last one. I want to take that. And I know that it's not going to be compared what you experienced or what we are experiencing. But we experience a trauma as well with the world war. And in this cultural inheritance, there are many people arriving who are traumatized themselves and me personally, and as many as who we know. And people who work as psychotherapists, we are often helpless how to meet them. And you have something like that behind you, had experienced me. Maybe you have a hint or an advice, a message to us which can help us when we meet our foreign cultures and you talk about the uh, reflecting I mean Germany. okay listen to Thomas a catastrophe a human catastrophe a traumatizing situation that was very deep and profound and now to Germany is coming uh, like a big a big crowd of very traumatized war victims from Syria and the Middle East and and um, and she's asking also as a psychotherapist, but also on a human level, what, how can, can we support those people the best when they are coming with a very fresh open wound that is also a very severe war trauma. And maybe by you having experience with and resilience, built resilience, maybe you can add something to her exploration, both of you. Well. I, I think I think the most important thing which happens now and which you're doing and that my mother mentioned she wishes it happened was you know in a way to witness to be present so I, th I think people with these experiences first of all need safety and our safety comes in many ways but I think in in sort of therapeutic ways, providing a space for people to be with, to be willing to bear witness to people's experience and suffering in whatever way they may need to express it. So I think, I think to not be afraid of the suffering that people are coming with, to be willing, to be really willing to engage with it is essential. So I, I think that that has got to be on a human level and psychological level in every sense one of the most important things and was absent, completely absent for people coming out of the Holocaust. There was really no provision, just silence. So even though the atrocities still happen, at least we've become aware in the world that people that we need to provide things for people to begin the process of some kind of some kind of kind, kind of reconnection with the possibility of life after but i think i think it's you know a huge huge project on on every level and i think everybody has to engage with it because there is a need on every level and people, of course, express their needs in different ways. Um, but I think dialogue, um, opportunities, open spaces are all critical to this inquiry. And it's new, you know, this is, we've really only just begun to do the work. So there's hope in that, I think. Okay, um, yeah, maybe here in the front. Uh, 
Yes, thank you for coming and inviting us to ask questions. And my question would be, what have been your major resources after the Holocaust to go on with your life and to, to stand up again? Look, I was so happy to be alive. <laughs> I didn't ask myself any questions. Get on with it now. Catch up with what you've lost. You know, I hardly went to school. And um, I wanted to be a musician, so you have to, to do something about that. So I had only one thing in mind, cello. Study, catch up. I didn't give myself time. A psychologist would say, that's typisch, you verdrängt, you know. No, I didn't. Have, I didn't have time. I wanted to get on with it. I'm still alive, now do what you wanted to do. And I wanted to be a cellist, and I became a cellist. So I'm the winner in the end. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the clear answer. <laughs> Pardon? Thank you for the clear answer. <laughs> Very simple, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, let's first go here and we come back, that's it. Yeah, you wanted to ask. Yeah. You know, I went with a German, first time I went to Belsen, with a German guy I met. Although I wasn't going to speak to any Germans, but you know, I did in the end. And he couldn't understand, how can I go and have a look at Belsen? I mean, Belsen now, of course, is completely, you just see the mass graves. And I said to him, you know, I won in the end, you know. I'm still around. They didn't mean me to be around, but so he understood. It was the first German I spoke to in Germany, although I swore never to speak to a German again. And needless to say, he's a great friend of mine over the years. So you see how stupid it is to make this decision. Das ist ein Deutscher, mit dem rede ich nie. No, it's okay. We're just people. Also, ich muss auf Deutsch fragen. Ja. Yeah. I had a question. Did you feel when you played in Auschwitz? She asked how Auschwitz feel about making music in the camp. You know, people, we, we've had all sorts of funny things appearing in papers, people blaming us that, how can you play music in it? You go to Auschwitz, you expect to be put in a gas chamber, somebody puts a cello in your hand, what are you going to do? <laughs> Say, no, I'm sorry, here, I don't play here, I only play in Carnegie Hall. <laughs> very simple. I mean, this cello was a, it was a lifeline suddenly. And it was. I was in Auschwitz for a year. Nobody survives Auschwitz for a year who hasn't got a special job like we made music. Yeah. And I only found out afterwards, I mean years afterwards, that there were bands in every single camp. There was music. Now, why was there music? You mustn't forget the uh, world didn't look in those days like it looks today. Auschwitz is, uh, I mean, perhaps somebody have, uh, some people have been there, pretty miserable place. Uh, don't think television was invented. So they, they were very bored, the German guards. They needed a bit of entertainment. We were the entertainment, not just the marches we played. But, you know, there was concert every Sunday. And, and you know who was the uh, conductor of this orchestra of mine? It was the uh, niece of Gustav Mahler, Alma Rosé. Very famous, well, you, you know, being Austrian, you know what family that comes from. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. It was a, quite an interesting band that we had there. Okay, machen wir vielleicht einmal noch in der Mitte und dann können wir darüber. Thank you. Uh, maybe I will ask something very personal. 
And if you think, uh, Maya, you are the uh, psychotherapist, uh -huh. Maya, yes, from you. Uh, if it is very, uh, very personal, then you can skip this part. <laughs> um, because uh, you were describing uh, in quite in detail your uh, attachment wound uh, and also how you were curing yourself uh, subconsciously at first and then uh, in a very conscious way and it became your profession. But how are you with this kind of attachment wound now? How can you really attach to your lover, your family? Do you have any? And the reason why I ask it, and because I have quite a lot of uh, Jewish friends, and some of them are uh, the children of Holocaust survivors. And uh, there is a, a pattern that I see that it is very, very uh, difficult for them to really relate and make a strong commitment. Yeah. OK. Well. Um, I have great difficulty with attachment. I've had three marriages. I'm not good at it, but I know that now. And that's okay. I'm... I've... I know the relationships that I do well in. And I know the relationships that I don't do well in. And... I don't do well in the dynamic, or maybe I didn't meet the right person, who knows. But I have a sense that I just don't do well in, you know, husband, wife, whatever you, way you want to describe it, type relationships. I don't like the experience of dependence. It makes me very anxious. So I prefer to be in relationships where there's a kind of different level of dependency where it's a kind of it's just different different so um, part of the wound is that that's not something you could say it's not something I've been successful at but the success is I've made peace with it and you know it's like I'm not saying never but I am saying I know what works for me and I know what doesn't and thank God I know when to run. I don't, you know, I didn't even get, actually, I don't even get to need to make that pace. And, and it's a really good thing that I'm not seeking to attach to another to fix something, which is what it was always about. Got to, you know, got to, you know, I need someone else to self-actualize. I really don't. So that's a good thing. So probably age nearly 60, I'm probably the best possible relationship state that I've ever been, except I don't really want one. <laughs> but, but I probably, probably would be, you know, at my wellest now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's go over here, one, and then maybe in the back, and two, two arms up. Thank you. Um, I hear you saying that you're the winner, and I admire you for that, really. And next to you sits your daughter, suffering. And I see peace between you, and this I really like very much. And I have a question to, you, to all of you. I work with clients, and I have a family uh, which I work with. Father is 73. Daughter, two daughters, one little over 50, the other below. And they came to me because they see that their relationships with each other is very full of rage and full of hatred. Still, they love each other. The father was three years old um, when the Russians walked in the Oderbruch. Uh, you might know about this incident in Germany. And so this family sits there on the chairs in my room and the father really um, longs for having a beautiful, loving relationship to his daughters. One daughter, the youngest, very much traumatized. It's not able to work, it's not able to live a a healthy life because of lots of pain and she's very much traumatized from the trauma of, his, of her father. 
the father wants to have this beautiful relationship, but he's not able, not willing, not capable to look at his trauma. What do you think about that? Do you have any advice for that? So, you have the whole family are in treatment with you. Well, I, I think that's pretty amazing. Me too. But I, I'm curious about what the father's need is to have what he thinks is a beautiful relationship. Because maybe as good as it gets is the willingness to come to the consulting room. The, what happened is his wife died in January and he fears to lose his family, his daughters. Mm -hmm. So his daughter is carrying a massive anxiety for him. Yeah. I'm not surprised she's making, maybe making some space. Um, she's, she was, in the beginning, she was very, very rageful and hateful towards him that he's not facing his history. And um, I, I um, gave space to the father to tell him, you do what you can do. I, you know, we won't for force you to look at it. If you want to look at it, you're not alone, but uh, if you're not willing to look at it, it's... What can you do, right? Well, and absolutely. But it's interesting as well that why, why it's an interesting energy that the daughter feels she has the right to, you know, insist or that the father does this. My father never, ever, ever would look at anything. That was his right. Yeah. So that's interesting to me, and maybe... I work with this uh, daughter, uh, by us, by just with her, too, in single sessions, which is good, but she's, she was insisting, she stopped it, but she was insisting, because she blamed him for her pain and for her being traumatized and suffering. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Difficult. But amazing that they come. Yeah. We sit a lot in silence. Mm. Mm. Thank you. The lady in the back. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Um, Her grandparents were in Auschwitz and uh, they were also, of course, heavily traumatized, but they worked there and they survived somehow her grandparents and and then one day she felt because she also works with trauma as a therapist and she she went back to Auschwitz and she had a very deep experience there of stillness and embracing the grandparents trauma and then she felt that her mother felt also better afterwards so her mother found a different relation because she went there to in a way on a her grandparents' trauma in Auschwitz. And her question, as far as I understood, I hope I'm telling this correctly, is that, um, that she asks the two of you if you went back to Auschwitz and what was your experience coming back and if this had any effect on your relation or on your individual experience. Yes, we went... I think I said earlier that I wanted to be the first person that went with my mother and it was the most traumatic experience of my life and it was traumatic for obvious reasons but I was completely unprepared but we also, the container for this event was a BBC film crew so imagine this BBC film crew follow my mother and I around um, starting in Berlin where my mother was on Kristallnacht to Breslau, Wroclaw in the prison cell where my mother was to Auschwitz-Birkenau and the film crew did this it was obviously, you know 
uh, not edited in any way. They just followed us. And my mother, she, uh, there had been no preparation. And what it was like for me was that I was completely alone in the experience. And I was because it wasn't my mother's experience. So when we arrived in Wroclaw, Breslau, which was the station that my mother was arrested at, I broke down completely, you know, obviously, obviously spontaneously. And my mother, and as she didn't do it consciously, turned away from me. So I stood on this platform, crying, 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 and my mother was in her own place, wherever she was. And this was the kind of energy that the whole experience had. Now, at this time, my mother was also, because she hadn't been back so often, and I was the first one. I was, had the job of interviewing my mother in Birkenau and all, these, all of these places. You can see it. It's a terrible documentary. Um, so I'm having this really weird talk about dissociative experience of being traumatized, interviewing my mother, being in these places and not knowing what the hell was going on. I was also one year postpartum, so I had a one-year-old child. I didn't know what the hell, I didn't know what was coming or going. And what I can tell you is that going into Birkenau for the first time, I was, of course, terrified. And in the... Uh, entrance to Birkenau, my mother sort of, I sort of felt paralyzed and I wanted, my bowels were going to open up, I just thought I was going to and my mother sort of pushed me through, because I was sort of immobilized, my mother kind of pushed me through the, what is it, on, of course it was the ramp through, and there we were, and my job was to interview my mother, not to have an experience with my mother. When I came back, I had a breakdown. It's not surprising. I had the biggest depression I ever had in my life. Terrible. But then, of course, the weirdest thing was when this thing went on TV. And suddenly, my experience was everybody's property. And people saying things about my mother to me, which I just... It was, it was like a form of abuse almost, it was terrible. Now it would be very different, very, very different, but it was a very, very, very difficult experience, really difficult experience. Um, yeah. So I can't say it was anything like what, what uh, you, you describe yours was. Uh, it certainly didn't heal anything for me, it undid something in me, for sure. Um, are you still open for one or two questions, or are you tired? That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Then. <laughs> yeah. Hello. It's about um the anti. It's about anti-Semitism in Germany at in present time. To assume right that a few weeks ago. You were at the university in uh, in Berlin, which is called PDS. Sorry, have you been with a English Parliament member? Then I am wrong. I will translate it. About the current anti-Semitism, and if you were with a British Parliament member in the German, where in the German university? Humboldt University. And the Humboldt. Did you speak currently? She. Okay. Um, but 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 why? But what I realize it is um, for me as a as a teacher for politics that um, there is a 
a big elephant in the room in Germany of anti-Semitism, and it's not seen by the media, not seen by many, many people, and when we are talking about the refugee, we always think about that there are traumatized people come in, but I realize that there is a mass of anti-Semitism in, in Germany now, and it's rising. And it, for me, it's, it's uh, nearly impossible to teach my, my, my pupils how to cope with, 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 with anti-Semitism, because I realize that in this classroom is, is this kind of um, anti-Semitism there, absolutely there. So, if you find this anti-Semitism in your classroom, yes? yes. Well, if you ask the people who make these anti-Semitic remarks, why do you not like Jews? What sort of answer would you get? Well, that's more this, this is coming from, from Arabic, from, from, from North Africa and, and, and Palestine and, and so. And, and we get an... an for me, I'm, 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 I'm helpless and, and I go out of school because I can't handle this anymore. Yeah, well... <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's nothing has changed really, you see. I mean, the most terrible things happen all over the world, but the slightest things happen in, uh, in Israel, which I'm sure is very objectionable. Jetzt können wir mal wieder antisemitisch sein. Yes, yes. That is the danger. It has all just been covered somehow for a bit because it wasn't gesellschaftsfähig to be an anti-Semite. Yeah. It didn't take two seconds to become gesellschaftsfähig again. So that's why I say how important it is to teach, I don't know whether you have the opportunity, young people a little bit about who, the, who are these funny people, these Jews that are everywhere. Why are they everywhere? And why are they so rich? I mean, all this nonsense. And uh, how many people know that Jesus Christ was really Joshua of Nazareth, a Jew? Bishnitna Jude. Not that many people know about that. I mean, there's a sort of lack of education somehow. But I haven't got hold out too much hope because the hatred of Jews is thousands of years old. Yeah. And uh, one would have thought that in Germany that would be the very place where perhaps one could find a healing process or... No. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's no wonder that Jews marry out. I mean, I've now got, uh, well, my son is married to somebody who's not Jewish. So I've got three half-Jewish grandchildren. One of them, both of them marry out, which the Jews find that very dangerous because the Jewish race will disappear. Um, maybe they should. I don't know. They never will because there are enough... Uh, hysterical orthodox people who cause a lot of trouble. <laughs> so, I mean, what can you do? Okay. You can try. I tried. Thank you. You can try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just maybe a gentleman over here. Gentleman. Mm -hmm. um, also, I stelle fest, dass Sie. I noticed that you found the language. For what was experienced in this family, I come from a family which didn't find a language for that. And they have the impression that that's uh, moved more than one generation, two or three. So I ask, uh, we have children and I wonder how strong they have the ability to live a normal life or a life. The things are showing where you can say, okay, this is based on the deep experience which was made by the prior generation. says that he sees that there you found the language to uh, describe, I mean, your relation and, and very detailed your, your inner process. And so he comes from a family where that's not the case, so where there was no language to go deeper with it say something also about anti-Semitism and the worry of it. One of my grandsons is very, very involved with young people in a sort of very, very, very young people 
to teach people, so he has a sort of sessions where all the people with brown eyes should go to one side and the people with blue eyes to the other and then they give a lot of power to the blue-eyed children and then what happens, they start attacking, I mean, you know, you follow me, he was in a sort of children's concept, he tries to explain to children how crazy it is to make a difference between people just because they have this particular um, color eye or something. So I think uh, Simon is doing very good work in educating really small. It has to start from very small. You'll never change adults now who hate Jews. You know, but with the children you can start this madness of different, different, differentiating between people. People are people. Before they have a nationality or a religion or anything else. So uh, Simon is doing a, is a very good job as an educator there. So maybe the last of one or two questions and then we finish. Maybe you, you raised already your hand for a long time. Yeah. In the second row, yeah. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for being here with us. I was very touched this morning to hear you are actually live in the hall and not just on video screen somewhere today. That's, for me, this is a great gift and I think for all of us to have you here. And I have a question about a healthy way of communicating trauma in a family because I feel traumatized by my father who was a soldier in Germany, very young man, um, and he told me about this time at a very early age, so at seven or eight. I feel this was too early that he told me about his experiences actually in a way trying to cure his past by telling me, which was not right, I know. Um, but I also see it, it's not the right way not to talk about it. I don't want to judge that or to, um, yeah, to reproach you or anybody else in the audience, but there is a fine line between communicating in the right way um, and at the right time. And I have a question to Thomas and Maya in, about this. I don't know about um, you if you want to tell us something about it. Um, yeah, this is my question. A healthy way to communicate traumatizing experiences. Because I feel there is a healthy way when we share um, experiences we feel that we are healing through each other in a way, so maybe there is a healthy way to communicate about it. My daughter should answer that question. Yes, I'll just give you one sentence at the microphone. Oh, sorry. Now you can make the best No, continue first. Continue. I mean, I think, you know, you, of course, describe one of the most painful ways to hear of traumatic experiences. I think if there is a healthy way, it has to be aligned to the one that is asking, the child, the adult, what is it you want to know? Not, this is what I'm going to tell you. But what is it you want to know? I mean, I was always uh, trying to protect my children from the trauma that I went through. I mean, what is the point? That's why we didn't talk about it. I mean, uh, what is the point? No, and I understand that well, and I wish my father had done that for a few more years, actually. But I have the feeling from talking to people that at some point it is good to communicate also in words, which anyway is communicated through the body, through the whole um, system, from parents to children. But is your story a Holocaust survival story or is no, it a German... It's, uh... it's somebody who had really traumatizing experiences through the war and told me about it and it's 
um, it doesn't yeah. like anybody who has really strong traumatizing experiences like needs to communicate them in the right way to the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I knew, no, I know when I mean I talk at schools also that I know how traumatized German children are. We know what happened to our forefathers, you know. A German child doesn't know. And that must be very traumatizing. And I think I'm absolutely right there. What do they know what their fathers have done? Their grandfathers, great grandfathers by now. They don't know. And they will live with this uncertainty. And that is not. Then it's easier to hate the bloody Jews again who caused all that trouble. You know, it's a sort of vicious circle. I get unhappy because I don't know what they've done. And look at these Jews, they're all rich and they take our money away and whatever. It's easier to think like that than to sit and say, my God, what has my great-grandfather done? I've become very friendly with the son of the guy who was in uh, Krakow, Frank. I don't know whether you know about him. Frank was their Oberkommandant in Krakow. You know, he was responsible for millions of murders. Well, he had four children, and one of them really hates his father for what he's done. And I met him at uh, something we did together, and we become great friends. And it is really funny to think of that, this absolute, I mean, you should find out what happened there in Krakow. They sort of reigned like king and queen. And the murder they got on their conscience is unbelievable. Imagine to be the son of such parents. Well, all the siblings are dead now. There's only one left. And he's just uh, written a book about his parents. I mean, it is so disgusting what these people did in, in Poland. Yes, and a lot of German people live with this uncertainty. What have they done, these people? So you're not, so not surprising that this, dass das wieder in Antisemitismus, that was is Juden schon schon mal aufhören mit dem Quatsch. Anyway, we all fight a, a fight a fight to make the world a bit better. Would you also answer something to my question, Thomas? Or maybe later, maybe not in this context. Yeah, maybe maybe I will say something later, but just one sentence maybe. Um, the way I understand human development is that that we as parents first need to, to own our experience before we pass it on to our children. And so I believe that the motivation of passing some, if the motivation is to relieve myself by telling it to you. I'm pretty sure that that was the motivation. Then that the traumatizing effect is already built in. And so if, if, if I go to my therapist or go to anywhere and I, I'll clarify this for me, I, I as a parent have a different role. My child is not my therapist. And I think that's why when you said, okay, what do you want to know? Then I don't have a pressure that you become my relief then I can share or not share what I feel is right or not in this moment. And so that's why if, if the motivation is a different one, then the child will always feel a, a difficulty with it because the child cannot process that information. And it's also not meant to do it. And that's why grown-up parents are supposed to be grown-up parents. And there is a very fine line, so, and, but I can talk more about it. I don't want to take the time. I want to give the time here, and, and I see also that we reach the limits of our afternoon. But, but I think it's an important topic. I think maybe I will come back to it on, in two days in the morning. Um, yeah. And I really want to thank you for your openness and also the a very open, vulnerable human part that you share with us. I think it's a very precious time for me and I'm sure for many in the whole. So thank you for this refined conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs>